During their trials in July 1990, Major Gideon Oka and his fellow conspirators reportedly told the military tribunal that their coup against General Ibrahim Babangida was in three steps. The last step was that unless all the junior officers were killed, there would be no hiding place for the Babangida regime. Two years later, in September 1992, over 150 middle grade officers died in a Lockheed C-130 plane crash. The aim of this video is to recall the unfortunate events of that day and what really caused the crash of the Lockheed C-130. The morning of Saturday, September 26, 1992, was dominated by environmental sanitation-related operations. The annual Nigerian Army Squash competition was held at the Keja Cantonment later that afternoon in Lagos, Nigeria. As was to become the annual pattern, Major Ademolekun won the title. The competition drew practically every major military leader in the Lagos area including the Lagos Garrison Commander and the Air Force Base Commander. After it was finished, the players, officials and visitors withdrew to the officers' mess for prizes and merriment, completely unaware of the fact that a national tragedy was occurring just a few miles away. Shortly before 5.30pm, a Nigerian Air Force military transport plane, a Lockheed C-130HLM Hercules, with registration number NAF-911, piloted by Wing Commanders J.P. Alabesono and A.S. Mamadi, received clearance from the control tower to take off en route to Kaduna and Jos. Its unique passengers planned to return to the Commandant Staff College in Jaji by road from the Kaduna airport. They had been in Lagos on a naval tour as part of the senior division course consisting primarily of middle-ranking officers recruited from the Nigerian Defense Academy's 19th, 20th and 21st regular courses with a few from the 18th course and some overseas students. The return trip had been postponed twice, once the day before and again earlier that Saturday due to reports that the aircraft had experienced engine problems while returning from unrelated business in Kaduna, Portakot and Enugu. When the final word came, over 150 people packed into the plane after a long wait at the airport. There were no seat belts on most of the passengers and some items of luggage were not secured. With all usual checks and formalities finished, the big turboprop plane thundered majestically down the runway and took off into the sunset to meet with fate. As soon as it took off, difficulties immediately became obvious. According to a witness, a former Nigerian Airways engineer who may have overheard radio messages, one engine failed, leading the pilots to turn around and return to the airport. While ascending, he might have had to try to trim the plane for a three-engine lift and feather the non-functioning engine. The second engine then failed. Due to a lack of power and lifts to negotiate a safe return to the airport, a decision was made to land the plane in the Ejibo Canal. According to reports, the pilot attempted to align the plane with the canal, even deploying water landing gear, but the third engine had failed at that point. Suddenly, and without warning, its nose dipped and the plane went down, nose first into the swamp, the fuselage buried in the mud, with the right wing and tail broken up. The time was just after 5.35 p.m., about five minutes after takeoff. Because there was no manifest, it was difficult to estimate how many people were on board. There were 168 students in Lagos, according to reports. However, a few people had made alternative arrangements due to delays and other concerns. According to estimates, there were 163 people on board. Others claimed that 174 people were on board the doomed flight, including unidentifiable civilians, employees from the Nigerian Air Force Military School in Jos, and other military personnel who caught a ride. What is known though is that there were no survivors. The grisly body count was claimed to have included random body parts during recovery operations. There were five more Ghanaians, one Tanzanian, one Zimbabwean, 
and one Uganda military officer involved in the ill-fated flights. The crash of the C-130 was among the world's 50 worst air crashes, military and civilian, in international aviation history. Indeed, among turboprop air crashes in particular, the C-130 with registration number NEF-911 was second to none and would hold that dubious distinction until August 1, 1996, when an Africa Air Antonov 32B crashed at the Kinshasa Ndolo Airport in Zaire, now Democratic Republic of Congo, killing 237 people. In Nigerian history specifically, counting all military and civilian crashes, the C-130 was third in fatality to the crashes on November 7, 1991 of a chartered Douglas DC-8 at Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, in which 261 pilgrims died and an earlier calamity on January 22, 1973 of a Boeing 707 Royal Jordanian Airlines at Kano, in which 202 pilgrims lost their lives. In other words, of the 50 worst air crashes in human history, three have involved planes connected to Nigeria. There was no coordinated rescue attempt set up in a time frame that would have been meaningful to the crash victims. The control tower, on the other hand, clearly realized something was amiss and alerted the airport commandant. According to conflicting reports, either a small Air Force fixed-wing aircraft or a Bristol helicopter was dispatched to the canal area to track down the aircraft. One account claims that the location could not be verified, while another claims that it was indeed verified. A small group of civilians and Air Force personnel reportedly arrived at a location near the scene some hours later, but were forced to quit their efforts because it was too dark and the swamp was too deep. They reasoned it would be best to try again in the morning. Meanwhile, officers in key command positions celebrated the end of the squash tournament at the officers' mess at the Keja cantonment. They wouldn't realize something was wrong for several hours. At about 8 pm that Saturday, Lieutenant Colonel Kayo Deare, one of the directing staff at the Commander Staff College in Jaji, made a long distance call to his cosmate in Lagos, Lieutenant Colonel Owoyi Azazi, commanding officer of the intelligence group at the Lagos garrison, to inquire about the crash. Azazi had not received any information. He then contacted several colleagues to see if the allegations that the plane had crashed were true. These officers had no idea what was going on. As a result, Azazi placed a call to Captain Hamza Al Mustafa, the Chief Security Officer, to Lieutenant General Sonia Abacha, the Chief of Defense Staff at the time. Mustafa was the one who confirmed that a plane carrying students of the Command and Staff College Jaji had crashed somewhere behind Festac. However, there were no directives from Abacha on whether or how to respond and it was unclear whether or not the Commander-in-Chief, General Ibrahim Babangida, was aware of the situation or, if so, had ordered anything to be done. As a result, early on Sunday morning, General Adisa, Commodore Akibi, Lieutenant Colonel Azazi and Captain Dende Joseph left for the Air Force Base. They were told the C-130 had crashed a few minutes after takeoff. They were also informed that a fixed-wing aircraft had set off on an inspection mission shortly before nightfall but could barely locate the site of the crash. The contingent left the Keja Air Force Base and proceeded for Festag Village but eventually found their way to the Ejibo Canal portion closer to the cantonment. Locals and Air Force personnel had already crossed the canal via the swamp to the crash scene a long time before. The conditions were tough and they were forced to wade through muddy water up to their navels. On the surface, it appeared that the only chance for life would have been immediate action. It didn't seem likely that anyone had a chance unless rescue had arrived within the first hour with the necessary equipment. Because the plane was overcrowded and only a few people wore seat belts, the majority of passengers were squashed against one another, luggage and various metal objects. Others died from crush injuries, some drowned and some suffocated while trapped within the depressurized oxygen-depleted hull. 
Some survivors were said to have scribbled notes indicating that they had survived the initial hit. Some area boys arrived later in the day and attempted to ransack and steal belongings from the deceased. They were chased away. Access into the aircraft's body was extremely tough on Sunday, the first day of recovery. Initially, it was suggested that a chainsaw be used, but this was postponed due to the risk of the fire spreading due to the vicinity of aviation fuel. As a result, gaining access was a tedious and laborious process that took place inch by inch. The first body out was that of a civilian. Many more hours of effort were put in before recovery crews were able to get inside the mass of victims, the most of which were pushed to the front of the plane deep beneath the water. Only 27 bodies were recovered that day. They were dragged out of the swamp, placed into canoes two at a time, transported to the canal edge, ferried across in boats again, and then transported to the vehicle park before being conveyed to the mortuary. Although Abacha is no longer alive and unable to defend himself, his relationship with Babangida while he was the chief of defense staff was complicated to say the least. According to reports, Money for defense needs was never assured to reach operational levels when the government distributed funds through conventional channels. In fact, according to a newspaper article, Babangida at one time gave money directly to angry unit commanders and peacekeeping troops rather than transferring it via the Ministry of Defense. If the claim is genuine, it could explain why a United States government grant for C-130 renovation that was announced in early 1992 never made it to the planes. All of this was taking place in the context of the deliberate dismantling of the Air Force in the aftermath of the alleged involvement of some Air Force officers in the so-called Mamavatsa conspiracy trial of 1985-1986. Due to a lack of tactical and strategic indigenous military capacity for serious rescue and recovery in a marine environment, as well as the High Command's bizarre refusal to seek foreign military assistance, Azazi, Adisa and others on ground decided to approach a locally based foreign company called Westminster Dredging on their own initiative. After inspecting the accident scene, one of their senior expatriate employees advised chopping trees and erecting ramps to create a footbridge across the marsh from the opposite bank to the crash site. For the first few days, the ramp was used before nets were hooked under helicopters to transfer the last wave of bodies through. It was evident that all corpses had been transferred out by the time the pilots, co-pilots and the flight engineer were recovered from the cockpit deep inside the swamp. Meanwhile, the government hired Julius Badger, a German company, to assist them. However, by the time Julius Badger arrived at the crash site, once Mr. Dredging had already retrieved all the victims, what remained was the recovery of the parts of the ill-fated plane, which was perhaps beyond the Army's engineering core technical capabilities. The bodies were then verified before being taken from the mortuaries in Lagos to Abuja. General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida, the head of state and commander-in-chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces, did not visit the crash site until Tuesday, September 29, 1992, observing it from the safety and distance of a helicopter circling above. On October 5, 1992, the crash victims were buried in a mass grave in Abuja with full military honors. At the funeral, Babangida described the plane crash as a calamity, striking in its impact and sad in its finality. When the Lockheed C-130 crashed, an investigating panel was reportedly set up under Rear Admiral Elik Bede. To this day, nearly 30 years after, its report has never been formally released to the public. Despite the fact that a naval officer conducted the C-130 investigation in 1992, it never saw the light of day and there was no opportunity for public involvement. When widows of the crash victims petitioned for unpaid benefits and demanded the report during the Oputa panel hearings in 2001, a horrid agreement was reached with the Ministry of Defense to compensate them, but no word was said about the release of the report. 
As previously stated, no formal reports about the C-130 crash has ever been made public in Nigeria, despite the fact that everyone involved understands the value of such reports in preventing such events and allowing bereaved families and friends to come to terms with their loss. As a result, no one quit or was fired from their jobs. Obviously, based on the manufacturer's technical specs, the plane was massively overcrowded with people. However, no information regarding the exact takeoff weight is available. Nevertheless, various international aviation disaster databases state that the C-130 crashed as a result of fuel contamination. It should be noted that the Nigerian government has never explained why the plane crashed 29 years ago, leaving room for all sorts of speculation. It has been alleged that the C-130 crashed to eliminate some middle-ranking officers in the aftermath of the failed April 22, 1990 Gideon Oka coup. As stated at the beginning of this video, Major Gideon Oka and his fellow conspirators during their trials in July 1990 had reportedly told the military tribunal that their coup against General Babangida was in three stages. The last stage was that unless all the junior officers were killed, there would be no hiding place for the Babangida regime. Of course, this is a mere speculation as not all the junior officers were killed. Although the coup led to certain reactive measures by the military against the services, units or corps that were thought to have been deeply involved in it. However, until the reports of what led to the C-130 plane crash of September 26, 1992 are released, these speculations will continue to abound.